Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about rare gastrointestinal cancers and pathways and how they can be optimized. And I, I guess that a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be mirrored by what Paolo said, because the, the same lessons are there throughout all, all rare cancers, really. Um, my only disclosure is that I've been for about 20 years uh, Chief Medical Advisor of the, the um, Bowel Cancer UK, which has taken on, uh, the charity has taken on uh, responsibility for squamous cell cancer of the anus and rectum. So it, it encompasses everything from the esophagus down to the, down to the anus. So there's an awful lot of different sites there. Um, and I think it breaks down into three broad disciplines, esophagogastric, hepatic biliary, colorectal, small bowel, and, and, and anal. And I think it's important that each of those disciplines really define uh, within, uh, within multidisciplinary teams and within networks, people who would have, they're not going to be specialists necessarily, but they would have extra knowledge about each of these things and know who, who, who to refer patients to. Uh, we've been through this, that uh, rare cancers uh, uh, have a small incidence. They include a lot of things in, um, in digestive cancers. Um, I, I really am a gastrointestinal oncologist with a specialist interest in squamous carcinoma of the anus, and I'm going to use that to illustrate uh, most of the things, I'm, uh, the lessons, but I've treated other cancers, but I'm going to use one to illustrate these. So... Squamous cell carcinoma of the anus is um, really uh, responsible for uh, quite unpleasant symptoms. It really comes from the HPV virus, which is very contagious uh, and is virtually endemic in most countries. It's very difficult not to, uh, to get human papilloma virus. In the UK, we have two uh, types, HPV 16 and 18, which are common. Um, the disease is modified by smoking, partly because uh, smoking actually impairs your immune system and allows you to the, the, the virus to, to, to stay with you and not be cleared. Um, and also, uh, it, it also has effects uh, on making uh, the, the cancer worse in, in many ways and more, more aggressive. Um, the age of diagnosis that you get, this is, is in the early 60s. And again, it's, as I said, persistent HPV infection. So if you've had previous HPV-related malignancies like uh, uh, vulval cancer or cervical cancer, you're more likely to get these things. HIV infection is, is a, a major cause of immune suppression and immunodeficiency. Uh, receptive anal intercourse, men who have sex with men, and tobacco smoking. All of those are risk factors. Um, and we know that uh, HPV-positive tumors, whether you look at that from the point of view of HPV or from the surrogate, which is P16-positive tumors, that these patients do very much better than those that are, that are negative. Um, the cancer develops because a long-standing HPV infection that you don't clear is driven by these E6 and E7 oncogenes that you see down there. Um, and uh, they... Uh, cause a degree of uh, suppression of your own immune system uh, and uh, tumor suppressor genes. Uh, and they also drive uh, really uh, problems with recognizing your, your, your cancer cell. They, they drive a, a loss of HLA expression. So in the end, it's a very complex process, I'm not going to go into it, but you get HPV positive tumors that are highly immunogenic uh, and HPV negative ones, which are usually low, uh, surprisingly, uh, because you'd think that they would be a bit like uh, some lung cancers. Anyway, the problem is then, if you have, as you can see, it's a very complex issue. So you have masses of information and masses amounts of questions from patients who want to know how, how to get the best of treatments and about things. So is everyone infected? The questions you get, is everyone infected? Why do any of you develop cancer? What allows it to persist? Why didn't I have any symptoms? Because most patients don't have any symptoms. Will antiviral treatments help? Should I be having acyclovir? Will HPV vaccination help? I've got the, my, my son and daughter have just had HPV vaccination. Should I have that? Will diet or exercise or any lifestyle help me? Is the treatment going to be a standard treatment? 
or is it going to be tailored to me? So there are masses and masses of questions. And to answer some of these, everyone gets infected by HPV. And you either clear the virus over time, and then you get some local host memory, or you transit to a chronic infectious state where you don't really get much in the way of systemic antibodies, if at all. But these kind of chronic viruses can persist, rather like I have, if I get sunburned, I get a hepatic lesion on the end of my nose uh, because the virus is still with me years after I got chickenpox. So chronic viruses are, are a feature of this. Um, one of the reasons why some patients, probably the virus will persist, uh, is partly explained by the, the gut microbiota and the anal microbiome, which we, we know has a big influence on lots of different things. This was a, a study where they took mice and they introduced the, the, the bacteria from the anus of men who have sex with men. And these mice were much more likely to catch HIV if you did that. And presumably, they're much more likely to, uh, to pres preserve and, and sustain HPV as well. So the anal microbiome is altered by anal sex because it's got high levels of fructose, citric acid, lipids. And if you combine that with smoking, there are local immunosuppressive effects in the anal canal, which is why these patients who both smoke and have sex, uh, anal sex often are more at risk. Um, so currently, though, we have, as I've talked about earlier, um, a vaccine, which is preventative against the nine most common HPV subtypes. And if you give this to boys and girls before they really start much sexual activity, effectively this should prevent anal cancer in the future. And we have some signals that this is actually working because if you look at this data from, uh, uh, from Australia, it's having a big impact on the population. So they have an extensive HPV vaccination, which should be going about 10 years. And over the past eight years, Australian women who contracted HPV fell by 92%. And cervical lesions that are precancerous reduced by 70% in the young ones and even 50% in the 20 to 24 age group. So the problem is that uh, in talking about I'm a specialist, these are two recent sort of uh, uh, presentations and papers about treatments for anal cancer. One is about imicromod, which is a, 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 an immune cream, and one is about a vaccine for against E6, E7, BGX3100. And I've never used either of these, so I'm supposed to be an expert, but even these I really have no experience with. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a sub-level expert in some ways. We go on a bit more about squamous cell carcinoma has a low tumor mutational burden, even in non-HPV-driven cancers. The mean number of mutations is 2.5 to 3.5. So you wouldn't expect it terribly to be uh, very s sensitive to immune uh, treatments, although it is. Um, when we look at the genomic profiling, apart from the, the one on the, the far left there, the PI3K, so there are very few uh, common uh, profiles uh, which we can uh, target, I guess. So in a rare cancer, you have some rare things like you, you might want to find the old fusion or something here, but there's no really targetable, easily targetable mutations there. So we have no clonal mutations, no valid biomarkers uh, to predict any response to treatment in terms of chemo radiation because chemo radiation is the standard of care. And so as I've kind of highlighted, it's extremely difficult to keep up to date whether you're an ordinary doctor, a specialist doctor, a part of an MDT. Because we live in a world where uh, there are such rapid and dramatic innovations and increasing clinical complexity, uh, which alter the landscape almost on a, on a monthly basis. So the average oncologist is going to say, hmm, you know, I've never seen anything like this. This is what one of my patients said. She saw an oncologist. I'm not sure how we should treat this. I'm not sure that's very, very comforting to a patient to hear that. Um, so successfully translating these advances means you need timely genomic immunohistochemistry screening. But, you know, you need to know when to test, whom to test, which test to use, and how to interpret those tests even when you have them. It's extremely complex. So even with a common cancer, 
like breast cancer and an up-to-date specialist, you as a patient might not get the details which concern you unless that particular specialist thinks it's interesting or important uh, because we're only human. So specialists like myself in hospitals, we only see our part of the disease according to our specialization. and We rarely see, rarely see the whole picture there. There are lots of challenges because it's difficult to diagnose. Um, a recent uh, statement was a GP in the UK with a couple of thousand patients would see eight or nine new cancer patients a year. But we've got data from practices in the West Country where 25% of the population will seek to advice from the GP because they have rectal bleeding. So the GP is, is, is rarely going to diagnose anal cancer straight off when one in four of his patients has rectal bleeding. And he's probably only going to see an anal cancer once in 25 years. When I was a new consultant, there was a, a, a local doctor, a general practitioner called Dr. Lau. And every patient that went through his practice, I work in North London, he sent them off to the Royal Marsden, which is a famous hospital, in South London. And I said, why, why are you doing this? I can, I can treat these patients. Uh, you know, these, these, they have to go right across London. And he said, well, yes, but you're not the expert. Those are the experts down there. Uh, I said, but they have to train, train all the way across London. And of course, in a sense, we were both right. Um, but it is a big challenge for GPs because it may present in a common way with rectal bleeding or in, in, a, in a different way. So it may prevent an, at an unusual site, squamosal carcinomas of the pancreas for digestive diseases. And as Paolo said, the pathologists may get it wrong because pathologists are only human and they don't have a, a huge specialist knowledge and average hospitals will have an average pathologist. It may prevent in, a, in an unusual way. So I think the problem is that until you find your, your specialist team, it can take you really quite a long time before you get a, a plan and before, as Paolo said, before you get any treatment. And only specialist teams, specific specialist teams, know really how to treat them. And it may take a long time for any patient to get to that specialist team. Paolo's already mentioned what we call a whoops operation. Uh, and uh, I used to be a radiation oncologist dealing with uh, sarcomas. And we did get an awful lot of patients where the, the, the biopsy was completely wrong. And so that patient would have a lot of sequelae, late sequelae from radiotherapy, which all that you had to do is to take the biopsy in a different direction and you wouldn't have get that. Tests get omitted, molecular testing, mutational load and things. You may need to travel a long way for you and get to get to the treatment for your rare cancer. So as a non-specialist doctor, you probably haven't had any treatment treat, training since you were at medical school. You don't know what to tell your patient and you may find it hard to answer any questions. So uh, it's, it's extremely difficult. Uh, trials in rare cancers are extremely difficult to do. So we don't have really, some people would say without a phase three trial, you cannot have a standard of care. I'm not sure I agree with that, but some people would say that. So we have if, to get the information, to get the, uh, the, the best way of dealing with things. You have websites, charities, individual experts, specialist multidisciplinary teams, both in hospitals and in networks. We have guidelines of best practice, pathways, networks, and trials. Don't underestimate trials. In, in the UK, we did a trial in anal cancer, which is a rare cancer. By the end of the trial, we were recruiting 25% of all patients in the UK, 25%. And so we improved the practice throughout the UK by doing a trial that was done in a country. And I think trials can really improve practice throughout uh, throughout and then we have the international rare cancers initiative which can drive trials as well so as i said we have uh, we have charities and they give lots of information and support cancer research uk uh, i like this one this portal will be designed as an educational tool to support both patients and healthcare professionals published papers uh, just before christmas 
I got an email from a patient I'd never met before asking my advice. I said, how, how did you get my, how did you get my email? They said, well, you're, you're on a paper in uh, Lancet Oncology, so I've just emailed you. Uh, specialist multidisciplinary teams are really very important. They include surgeons, medical oncologists. I think we, uh, Paolo's already emphasized this. But they're, they're specialist gynecologists. They're specialist plastic surgeons as well. They're super specialists. Um, and these things are absolutely vital to, to, to make decisions and to get the best treatment. Uh, There's a nice paper recently, uh, not in anal cancer, but looking at the challenges that multidisciplinary centers for rare cancers have to deal with. And I really liked some of the, uh, the ways that they looked at this. So we have guidelines. Guidelines, uh, I was partly responsible for the ESMO guidelines on the left, and there's the NCCN guidelines uh, on the right, which give you kind of pathways to tell you what to do. But in a kind of funny kind of way, it's more of an a la carte menu. You can have what you like on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the menu there. What you want is someone to say, this is what the chef recommends today for you because it's a hot day and I've just cooked this wonderful meal for this wonderful fish. That's what you want, not just a a la carte menu. The Rare Cancers Initiative, I, I, I have a great deal of time for this. We've actually managed to do uh, a, a large phase, randomized phase two internationally across several countries throughout uh, Erki. Um, and you have to get the email of all members. You need um, uh, ongoing cancer trials and lists of treatment trials that are in, pre in preparation. And these kind of foster new ideas of how you can do potential trials uh, and correlate trials, that even if lots of individual countries are doing their own trials, you can do correlate trials with a molecular, genomic, immunological, imaging, etc., etc., with a brief sort of summary. So we do have plans for, I think, one of the things that could help a lot is having international meetings for, for rare cancers, either separate or on the back of major things like ASCO. Uh, and this is part of uh, ERKI at the moment, we're trying to get an international consensus on how you stage anal cancer. Uh, and uh, this, will, this will be touted around uh, a lot of European centers at, at meetings and things. So pathways, uh, develop tools to support and, and inform care delivery. They should be cost effective. And so they should actually save money. And the problem is most cancer pathways have really focused on decision-making as regards the expensive drugs. Uh, and I think they should really focus on optimizing other aspects of care in the future. We talked a little bit about earlier about uh, Uricam and rare adult solid tumors. Uh, and I don't think these are directly accessible to individual patients. Um, I think one of the problems, I, I, I found five centers that said that they were interested in anal cancer. I'm not a, I don't, uh, take, I don't know, I'm not a European reference uh, network provider, but I emailed two colleagues that I know reasonably well who treat anal cancer and asked them how in practice this worked. Well, that was three weeks ago, and so they haven't replied to me. So I don't think if you email these guys as a patient, you're ever going to get a reply because they haven't replied to me after three weeks and I know them. So I think we should prioritize clinical options, efficacy, toxicity, and cost in that order and not the other way around. In summary, I think education is the key. You need to inform the whole population and there are lots of things we talked about, websites. If you inform everyone, then you inform GPs, non-specialists, other doctors. We need resources for the inquisitor to find out queries. We need much more quality assurance in pathology and better access for patients to networks if required. Thank you very much for your attention.